So we're lucky to have such amazing writers in D.C., and we're doubly blessed to have so many of these authors be politics and prose fixtures. Uh, both Sandra and Kyle are friends to us, so it's a pleasure to celebrate their success with their latest books, which are a testament to their ever-evolving talent. Um, there's a particular symmetry to my hosting, Sandra, for Count the Waves, um, which I've been dying to read for months and months. But um, we kind of go back in a funny way. Uh, when I was still a bookseller, like about five or six years ago at McNally Jackson um, in New York, I was hosting this series of poets with their first books, and one of those poets was Sandra. <laughs> and um, I remember talking to her after the reading that uh, right around that time I was actually moving to DC because um, my husband's a political consultant, shocker. Um, and she gave me her business card and told me to look her up when I got into town. And you know, and I've been here for a while now, and I'm so happy we've gotten to become friends. Um, she's just probably one of the most generous, amazing people. I've met, you know, just as supportive of a, a fellow poet such as myself, as well as the store and booksellers, and just, we love you. We love you. <laughs> I love you. Um, I didn't get to host her for her second book. I was a jukebox, which was picked by Joy Herger, who's like my poet heroine, um, uh, to win that one, the Barnard Women's Poets Prize. Uh, but I did get to host Sandra for her last book, which um, was a memoir about her crazy allergy issues <laughs> called Don't Kill the Birthday Girl. And here we are once again, which is very cool. Um, uh, and while Kyle and I don't have quite as deep a history, his, he has done events with us in the past, and he is a great supporter of the store. And he's also, you know, a part of the neighborhood. Um, and we, in return, are a great supporter of him. Uh, he's a professor at American University, um, which is just up the way. And he has three previous books and is the founder and editor of Post No Ills magazine. And his latest book, Honest Engine, is exactly that, honest and unflinching. So I do believe he's the first one to come up to read. So please welcome Kyle Dargan. Thank you, Angela, and uh, thanks to Politics and Prose. It's a, you know, a bit of a dream to do this. There were a number uh, of independent bookstores here when I came to DC in 2005, and unfortunately, seen a lot um, fall away. So I'm very glad that Politics and Prose is still here, and I'm also glad that I lasted long enough as a writer uh, <laughs> to eventually make it to having a reading at this store. Uh, I guess a quick story. I left Rutgers Newark uh, when I was 18 because you couldn't take a poetry workshop until your senior year at the university. Um, and I said, I'm not going to wait, you know, four years to study writing. Um, and that's when I applied to transfer to the University of Virginia, which was where I first met Sandra um, in a workshop with Lisa Rusbar. And I remember thinking, like, who is this, like, young person that's, like, so serious about poetry? I mean, I was, I was serious in the sense that, but, I mean, this is someone that seemed to have, like, a, a plan, like, uh, around, <laughs> around poetry. Like, I'm just here writing poems and this. Um, but eventually our relationship as writers, classmates, um, editors, we both worked on the, the magazine 3.7. She was the editor. I was the, the poetry editor. So our past became more and more intertwined as time went on and then I went off to Indiana for grad school Sandra came up to DC to uh, AU where I teach now um, and eventually AU brought me back um, to DC and then Sandra and I have been sort of reunited in that um, and it's it's really great I mean I don't think many people have such a close view of someone's progression and evolution as an artist um, as I do with Sandra's work, you know, being in those early workshops with Lisa Sparr and Rita Dove and Charles Wright, and to just see, you know, now three books later for her and four books later for me that, you know, we're still doing this and still learning from each other. It's just really um, special. So I'm just honored to be able to do this because, you know, it means so much. And it's rare that you have those kind of artistic relationships that last um, that long. So anyway, I'm going to shut up. Um, and read some poems and maybe try to sell some books other than my own. I, being in a bookstore, I want to talk about books. Um, so this first piece is actually from my first uh, collection, The Listening. I used to be the editor for Callaloo, which meant I would leave D.C. in the summer and travel down to Houston, Texas and live in uh, the editor's house, Charles Rao. Um, 
and he has this garage, which is basically a bookstore. Um, and so this poem is somewhat about this. Uh, the poet, deceased poet, uh, Rita Kavazarani, actually once gave me the assignment of uh, seeking out a certain Robert Hayden poem. Um, and she was wrong about the, the, the poem, but, you know, it went on the journey. So in, in a way, this, this, this poem was a homage to Rita Kattu, who was a DC fixture and is unfortunately not here anymore. Um, search for Robert Hayden. The garage has not been allowed to breathe for months now. The smell of moving, uprooting, cures in the arid Texas heat. Sense not to be romanticized, but handled carefully so that no boxes topple. We are looking for the middle passage. First, we must clear a walking path. Books yelp like kennel pups through the holes in their crates. Books that are no longer books, but subheads and chimeras of collected poems. Next, copacetic, victims of the latest dance craze. All originals bearing signatures like birth certificates. Clifton, no gray. Kumanyaka, with beard. Edie, looking as young as the lost member of New Edition. Most out of print and born before I was pressed in flesh. The past presented, Hayden is still hiding somewhere. Putting an ear to the walls doesn't help. This year old house barely knows its own nooks and stashes. Hell, round them all up. In minutes we'll be standing knee deep in the unselected poems of black literature. This is how we will find Hayden, on our hands and knees, combing over flailed books, seashells beneath a forgotten tide. Occasionally, we'll rinse something up, not what we're looking for, and read it anyway. Um, speaking of stuff that not looking for, I've taken the habit of reading a sociology or urban studies book every summer just to get away from literature. Um, picked this up during the MFA reading here at Politics and Prose, The Vanishing Neighbor by Mark uh, Dunkelman. Good book, recommend it about three quarters of the way through, trying to get as much reading done before the next semester chaos starts. Um, so to jump to Honest Engine, if, if you read any of the reviews of the book, a lot of the writing focuses on the subject of loss, um, and that is a significant element of the book, but more importantly, it's sort of a book about maturation, um, and loss is one of the avenues for that maturation. It's not a book that's entirely focused on loss. Um, some of it focused on spirituality. So this Sunday, this poem is Eucharist. God the locksmith, God the language, the unfinished suits of us. God the tailor. God the lighthouse in tempest. God the immune system, afflicted we. God the earthen pot path. God the cross vaulted and high. God the un everything, as in the alpha inscribed between omegas labia. God the eye. God the histamine inhibitor, bless me. May our heads not split to see the gods within our God. God, the stained glass window, spectrum of unraveled white light. God, the father of the bait, hook, line, sink into us. The word of prophets and a son who dissolves on our tongues. Um, so I wanted to read as many DC poems from the book as possible. Uh, I guess there's 10 years worth of living in DC to get to this book. There are some DC poems in Bouquet of Hunger, some DC poems in Lagerie Dementia, but there are more DC poems in Honest Engine. And this piece actually uh, appeared in the District Lines Anthology that Politics and Post uh, published. If you haven't picked that up, check it out. So I live on the east side of town in southeast and um, State of the Union is often a nightmare for me because it means I can't get back across Pennsylvania Avenue to get back to my house. Um, so there have been a number of nights when I just said to hell with it and I just stop and get a drink and wait for all the traffic to let out so I can get back to my house. Not even traffic, just the blocks. You know, they don't let the buses go certain routes. Um, 
And one of the things I noticed one night when I did actually make it home to my house before State of the Union uh, was that even that far out east, they have the helicopter patrols around the perimeter. So, you know, you have that one. I'm like, why is this helicopter over my house? And I'm thinking, oh, right control in the airspace. Um, so I started thinking more and more about the State of the Union as someone who lives in a district. And that's the title of the poem, State of the Union. I live in a land called East of the River, five miles from the US Capitol, where airspace must still be policed, no fly zones. Tonight, a helicopter freezes into a shallow star blinking above my house while the men and women of government herd themselves inside the Senate chambers. Our commander in chief and all his cabinet, save one, traditionally one, who is excluded and tasked with waiting to resurrect our country should Iran, Russia, China, or what's left of Iraq try to bowl a ballistic 710 split, toppling the monument and capital. Tonight is the agriculture secretary's duty to save us. It should always be our agriculture secretary. <laughs> In times of crisis, a country needs before commerce or war or law to eat. And if Congress has allowed the appointment of an agriculture secretary who can't grow a pea, might we not deserve oblivion? <laughs> I prefer to imagine our Secretary of Agriculture hunkered in his undisclosed location, listening to the speech on battery-powered radio, sifting seed through his dusty palms, deciding what must grow first in the aftermath of fire. Um, so, jumping around books again. This is a DC poem, you wouldn't know it. I wrote it, I was sitting in the Ronald Reagan building um, in the food court. And there used to, it used to be a Sabaros down there because I'm from New Jersey, so my standards for pizza are very high. And most of this stuff around here doesn't cut it, so I have to go to Sabaros. Yes, I said that, <laughs> it's true. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's subpar DC pizza, someone needs to fix this. Um, so anyway, I'm in Sabaros. People say, I had two Amy's. Ah, hey, that's genre pizza. I just want a good slice of pizza. So I go to Sabaros sometimes. And this was where one of the Sabaros was, the other one, Union Station. Um, and I hate red onions. Um, I think that's all you need to know. Uh, <laughs> so the poem is called Infomercial Soliloquy Against Apocalypse. Um, a pizza slice has forced me to ponder the red onion's necessity the ifs of its being. Difficult to imagine some priest praying for Red Onion's existence. It isn't like God even takes requests anymore, this call-in show taped ages ago in endless rerun. Maybe the big G is a marketer at heart, driven to see if there's anything he can't sell. Product of the week, produce, Red Onion. I was sold the idea that God is male, that I'm not chosen and thus his skin will never match mine. Even if I could, I wouldn't choose the guise of God. What kind of mirror masochist would one have to be? Say, I'd loathe to look like LeBron, yet only be able to, f only be able to fly one foot off the ground. People would always demand, dunk, dunk. And I'd have to spin excuses on my finger like a ball try to make slamming down a wastebasket miraculous. King James could even sue me for soft defamation, like John Malkovich in that movie about John Malkovich <laughs> that really wasn't about John Malkovich. <laughs> God never saw a human being or red onion he didn't like, because that is his job, a heart-to-heart -heart salesman, knocking on your thorax, carrying an attache, of something you've just got to try. <laughs> what? I'm gonna do that poem. I might not do that poem. Uh, so this poem, DC, I was with the Washington Post reporter, my friend Elahe Zade, and we were trying to get from Logan Circle up to Columbia Heights on the bus during rush hour, which was an awful idea. Um, and recently I've traveled to China twice. I just got back 
I was in China for two months in the fall. Uh, it's my second trip. Um, there's a lot of similarities between uh, Beijing and um, DC. Um, well, I mean, we have one beltway, they have like nine, uh, the ring roads, but there's some other similarities. So I've been thinking a lot about relationship between DC and Beijing and writing more about it. Maybe a chat book will come out of it. I don't know a full book, but anyway. Uh, this poem is China Syndrome or a Slow Ride from Logan to the Heights for Lahe. In China, the transit coaches ride on four legs with wheels for feet, straddling any cars gridlocked below. That is how I want my weary mind to regale you once we've realized, once it's evident, we could have hoofed these 10 blocks faster than traffic will permit this 54 bus we squeeze within. Finding a seat beside a Caucasian girl lecturing an Egyptian man about Christopher Columbus. I mean, who does that? Comes to a country and says, I own you now, you know? In this moment, the blank-faced Salvadorian giving us both the, you hearing this crap, I? I realize why, of all the odd beauty I saw in China, I mainly remember those buses. Mere awe, not of the elevated carriages, but of the fact that China grew tired of traffic and decided to venture a solution. I'm no communist, but I'm tired of waking vex in this land of Cialis and picture and picture and picture flat screens. I want our American generation to cure something major erase one smudge from humanity's horizon. When did it come to be that our good ideas only migrate here? We used to yank them from our soil. No one is looking at us. Off the bus, you say that traffic is no major ill, but you have never traveled to Beijing. You have not seen its sky smogged through to an opaque sadness. For you, I would describe it, but for now, for argument's sake, I need you to think of China as that broad, beautiful place our promise abandoned us for. Uh, this is another China poem. Uh, the first time I we went to China, the Chinese delegation came here. We went to Iowa, and we both read Cormac McCarthy's The Road together. Um, and it led to some interesting conversations between the way they frame history and the way we frame history. Um, so this is Cormac McCarthy as translation. We are in Iowa City reading The Road when Xiao Fan gently scolds us. You Americans, always worried for, always in need of saving the world. Were it not for the fact that I know his sense of the American narrative is steeped in bootleg Michael Bay cinema from a Shanghai back alley contraband cave, he'll drag me inside months from now. I would consider his critique. Maybe some of wisdom, wisdom's breath wafts within what he says. Maybe he can see us clearly, our bald-faced nationhood, here against an unadorned middle America. Our God complex so obvious when wreathed with lush amber and green stalks. Another misconception that would be, for there is no such middle America everywhere or the need to be everywhere has no middle. And yes, planet America requires saving sometimes. Maybe that is why our stories all begin with the world almost ending here. That keeps us up at night, shatters our sleep, which Xiao Fan can't grasp because he was never taught our pottery barn rule, that if you saved it, then you've broken it, then it's yours. <laughs> Um, so sometimes, you know, poetry does good things for you. Um, I have a poem coming up in Poetry Magazine. I'm, I'm saving that check to pay off the last of my student loans. So I can say that <laughs> poetry got me out of debt to Sally Mae. Um, another, another thing poetry did for me is actually got me on Bill Moyers because Bill Moyers apparently reads poetry. Um, and he saw this poem and invited me on the show, and we had an interesting conversation. Um, 
And I think it also speaks a lot to what's what's going on right now. It, everyone looks at what's happened in Cleveland and Baltimore um, and Ferguson and wondered, like, well, can it happen to D.C.? And then D.C. seems a world away, but it really isn't. Um, it's quite close. It's just that it may be our realities, our personal realities are growing uh, more and more estranged from each other. Um, and this poem speaks to that a bit, House Divided. On a railroad, railroad car in your America, I made the acquaintance of a man who sang a life song with these lyrics. Do whatever you can to avoid becoming a roofing man. Maybe you would deem his tenor elitist, or you would hear him as falling off working class key. He sang not from his heart, but his pulsing imagination, where all roofs are sloped like spires and sequoia tall. Who would wish for themselves or another such a treacherous climb? In your America, a clay-colored colt stomps, its hooves cursing the barn's chronic lean. In your America, blood pulses within the fields, slow poaching a mill saw's buried flesh. In my America, my father awakens again thankful that my face is not the face returning his glare from above 11 o'clock news murder headlines. In his imagination, the odds are just as convincing that I would be posted on a corner pushing powder instead of poems. No reflection of him as a father nor me as a son. We were merely born in a city where the roofs beyond our doors were the streets that Shanghai souls. To you, my America appears distant if even real at all, while you are barely visible to me. Yet we continue stealing glances at each other from across the tattered hallways of this overgrown house we call a nation. A new wall erected every minute, a bedroom added beneath its leaking canopy of dreams. We hear the dripping. We feel drafts wrap cold fingers about our necks, but neither you nor I trust each other to hold the ladder or to ascend. Um, just listening to an article last week on NPR about how robots are coming for white collar jobs too. And I thought it was interesting, like we used to fear robots just coming to kill us. And now I think we fear more robots taking our jobs than them actually coming to destroy us. Um, well, that would be a certain type of destruction. But this is this good old-fashioned poem about the robots coming to destroy us. Um, <laughs> the robots are coming. The robots are coming with clear case woofers for heads, no eyes. They see us as a mosquito. They see us as a bat sees a mosquito, a fleshy echo, a morsel of sound. You've heard their intergalactic tour buses purring at our stratosphere's curb. They await counterintelligence transmissions from our laptops and blue teeth. Await word of humanity's critical mass, our ripening. How many times have we dreamed it this way? The age of the machines. Post-industrial terrors whose tempered paws, five welded fingers, wrench back our roofs. Siderophilic tongue seeking blood, licking the crumbs of us from our beds. Oh, great nation, it won't be pretty. What land will we now barter for our lives? A treaty inked in advance of the metal one's footfall. Give them Gary. Give them Detroit, Pittsburgh, Braddock. Those forgotten nurseries of girdles and axers, axles. Tell the machines we honor their dead distant cousins. Tell them we tendered those cities to repose out of respect for welded steel's bygone era. Tell them Ford and Carnegie were giant men that war glazed their palms with gold. Tell them we soft beings mourn manufacturer's death as our own. Um, so this next poem, there's actually a book out there in the nonfiction section called The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace. Uh, Rob was a, a classmate of mine at St. Benedict's in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and just odd coincidence that this book came out um, at the same time that Honest Engine came out. And I have this poem in the book about Rob. Um, I don't think a Rob's life is tragic, though. Um, it is sad that he was murdered. Um, 
but much of what I remember of Rob was from our time at St. Benedict's um, as boys. Um, though there's still some sadness in that. Uh, so this piece is called Fool's Therapy. Um, and it's for Rob and other dead bees. Um, our mascot was the gray bees, St. Benedict's gray bees. Fool's Therapy. Robert Peace is dead. Those words, writing them, should have sawed something. They do not. They say nothing, nothing of his gruff brilliance, nor lure my mind to parse the syntax of his passing. I still envy the ease with which Rob untangled derivatives. He helped me feel the relief of not being the smartest head in the classroom, a grace that serves any fool well later in life. Still, peace could also say the droll things that needed saying, as he did during religion class, his eyes absent off reading through the window what awaited us beyond senior year, beyond Newark. He opined, Beyonce is so fine I drink her bath water. <laughs> his hyperbole turned my stomach, recalling too well what I'd learned of the body and what it secretes, knowing too little of lust. What was it then peace was teaching me? My mind too busy mulling what Father Matthew meant by saying, sex without love is no more than masturbation. He meant if you seek pleasure, seek pleasure, not acts of love. I inflate my basketball the day after I learn peace has been shot, has died. I walk onto a giving plane of hardwood and flick three pointers at the hoop, not in love with the world, just wanting it to grant me simple pleasure, the release of releasing the ball from my fingertips. No teenager, my knees now burn with each leap and drift, but at least I can predict what follows here. Peace is dead. I please myself with shooting jumpers, sneaker squeak, tap of landing, swish of contact, the sequence a sonic solve. I don't love the world in this moment. I do as Father Matthew taught us. And I'm going to close with a UVA poem since that's where this all started. Um, and it's my dad's birthday. He's not here. Um, but he's in this poem. Um, he's, the, he's the turn in this poem, actually. Um, I don't know if every, any of you remember Shawshank Redemption, but there's that moment when, like, um, Morgan Freeman's character is out of jail, and he's just sort of, like, walking around the world, and he's looking at the way women are dressing now as opposed to the way he went in. He's just like, I don't know how to deal with all this. Um, that's what it was like having my father come visit me in college. He was like, oh, what's going on? And... So we, we had this, this conversation um, after I brought him down to Charlottesville for a visit. Um, but that's not where the, the poem starts. Charm. Stowed just behind my ear, hidden yet within quick recall, this memory of the Memduhai sisters and the dance they danced before a capacity audience of me. I'd crossed the Lambeth Common, climbed the stairs to the younger's dorm room, in need of some book whose importance withered once I arrived and they asked if I wanted to see them move together. Too shy to say yes with confidence, too man not to say sure. Today I would say please, I would say thank you before such a gift is given. It's precision, synchronized sisters, Transfixed, such a stiff word. Give me a term that blends guilt and awe, makes a duet of those feelings. I, it would name the swirl in my gut as I trained my gaze to their sharpened feet, pursed thumbs and index fingers, blinking eyes like chimes. I wondered who was I to be offered their dance homework? Who would believe what I was being shown? I studied, made an art of being present, certain this recital would never happen again. As I later floated from their dorm room, my father's voice shook my skull. Son, life is all downhill after college. <laughs> I stashed the memory of their dance for the days when I feel my father just might be right. 
and I'm descending midlife's gyre. I've been lucky. I saw some of the summit. I can remember that I'm tumbling from an apex of grace. Thank you. That was very powerful. Let's take a moment to let that settle. It's like when you're confronted with poetry, it's, it's a lot. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, and let's please welcome up Sandra Beasley. <laughs> How are we doing this afternoon? Good. This is pretty surreal to look out at a room filled with friends and family and fellow writers and um, people from all different circles. That's one thing about growing up in the area and choosing to stay here is that uh, you know it's pretty much everyone short of your kindergarten teacher. And if she's here, don't stand. It'll freak me out. Um, and so I just want to. Um, say thank you to Kyle for that amazing reading. I, as he mentioned, we workshopped together at, at University of Virginia and then moved forward into the world and, and right out the gate he uh, had this amazing uh, opportunity, this incredibly deserved opportunity to publish The Listening, uh, which was the won the Cave Con and Book Prize. And what that meant was for me as an MFA student at American University, when they were announcing the Visiting Writer series, they said, oh, there's this great young up and coming poet, uh, Kyle Dargan. And I was like, wait, Kyle? And I'm required to go to his reading? Like he was on the, you know, he was on the marquee. And, and I'm so grateful for that because uh, sometimes when you come up with someone, you don't often get that opportunity to step back and really appreciate what they're doing in their work. And I've um, now looking at his fourth book, I truly think that Kyle Dargan is going to end up being w one of the most important voices that we have of this contemporary group of poets. And I don't mean that in the sense of playing the game and doing the networking and, you know, maybe even not always getting the awards, I mean that he's writing poems that matter. And so I'm so thrilled there's no one else whose fellow voice I'd rather have you here today. Um, that said, I have to mention that there's a number of poets in the room and writers of fiction and nonfiction writers whose voices are important to me. Um, at Haley Lighthouser and Maureen Thorson, who along with Kyle Dargan were the first readers for this book. And I think that an important thing about being part of a literary community is realizing that if we're lucky enough to have our work visited 30 years from now, I want someone to know that they can better understand what I was choosing to write by understanding those who I was choosing to read and those who I was choosing to hang out with and be part of a community with. So, thank you. I'm gonna, uh, open with the first poem in the book. Uh, it's a poem called Inner Flamingo. And I wanted a, a poem that kind of established an overall journey. There's a lot of narrative threads going on in Count the Waves. But one of them is this idea of love letters, written not necessarily to seduce, uh, not necessarily to reveal, but to say, you know, this is who I am. This is how I have gotten here. And I think in many ways, this poem, which uh, anybody who knew me in my days of living right by the National Zoo knows that I take great pride in spending time in the aviary section, um, was inspired by that sense of the, the inner self rising to the surface. Inner flamingo. At night, my body discovers her secret geometries. Inner flamingo knee hitch, inner flamenco arm arch, Hermes diagonal of flight across the mattress. The sleeping body is selfish. The sleeping body cannot lie. Once there was a man from whom I always woke huddled at the bed's edge. Then there was a man who laid his lust as a door knocker at the small of my back. The first time I laid down with you, sweat stuck, each onioned in the skin of the other, I assumed the unconscious hours would peel us free, yet when sun cracked its eye over the horizon, we were as we'd been, and the pink of me cocked her head, listening. <coughs> So part of the book's journey is to lay out that 
that initial arc, but then kind of move backwards a little bit and uh, present vignettes, snapshots of some of the relationships that, if there is a common narrator of sorts, um, some of the relationships that he or she goes through. This poem was inspired in part by a tableau experienced in Mississippi, uh, staying in a household in which there were four cats. Um, the real live cats didn't make it into the poem, but they became porcelain ones. Parable. Worries come to a man and a woman, small ones, light in the hand. The man decides to swallow his worries, hiding them deep within himself. The woman throws hers as far as she can from their porch. They touch each other, relieved. They make coffee and make plans for the seaside in May. All the while, the worries of the man take his insides as their oyster, coating themselves in juice, first gastric, then nacreous, growing layer upon layer. And in the fields beyond the wash line, the worries of the woman take root, stretching tendrils through the rich soil. The parable tells us, consider the ravens, but the ravens call useless from the gutters of this house. The parable tells us, consider the lilies, but they shiver in the side yard, silent. What the parable does not tell you is that this woman collects porcelain cats, some big, some small, some gilded, some plain. One stops doors, one cups cream, and another sugar. The man knows they are tacky. Still, when the one that be had belonged to her great aunt fell and broke, he held her as she wept, held her even after her breath had lengthened to sleep. The parable does not care about these things. Worry has come to the house of a man and a woman. Their garden yields greens gone bitter, corn cowering in its husk. He asks himself, what will we eat? They sit at the table and open the mail, a bill, a bill, a bill, an invitation. She turns a salt shaker cat between her palms and asks, what will we wear? He rubs her wrist with his thumb. He wonders how to offer the string of pearls writhing in his belly. So as I mentioned, that, that poem is partially inspired by Oxford. A variety of other places are threaded through this book. I mean, Brooklyn, Pittsburgh, uh, artist residencies or colonies in Swanee, Tennessee, Miami, Virginia, Wyoming, all places where poems from this were written. Uh, glimpses as well of both Paris and Venice in a set of poems about artists. Um, but this next poem is very much a DC poem. It was, uh, I was fortunate enough to receive the Larry Neal Award for it, and it did appear in Politics and Prose District Lines Anthology, which is a really great showcase for, for local writers. It's called One Tenth of the Body, and it was a, a inspired by the Red Line Metro crash incident, which I heard about while I was in Wyoming, and that was my line. Um, and I think everybody who heard about that felt that moment of vulnerability. One Tenth of the Body. The ship's steward didn't know what he had photographed. They looked at that smear along the berg's base, red paint from the Titanic's hull, and called it the wound, as if the North Atlantic's ice had gashed its side in sympathy. But they had seen only one tenth of the frozen body, what they thought a shroud no more than a kerchief, the red silk any disaster tucks in its pocket before stepping out to dance. If a metro car comes behind another and mounts it, that first squeal sounds almost like joy. On the red line train, a man watches the floor peel away beneath his feet. He knows what happens when you set tinned fish free. Um, 
So before living in D.C. proper, I lived in Northern Virginia with my family, which I'm very gr grateful to have them here today. And uh, I attended Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. Big nerd, had my own key to my own helium neon laser. Um, and, uh, and I took psych class. And psych class was taught by a wonderful woman, uh, Ms. Hannah. And uh, she found all kinds of inventive ways to teach us basic lessons of psychological syndromes and disorders and went forward into the world. And I thought, well, that's pretty much standard textbook. And there was this one thing that she used to teach us that I realized as I went forward into the world, no, not everyone uses this way of teaching this lesson, not at all. So if you ever studied psych in uh, high school or college, you'll recognize some of the exemplars and names that pop up. The psychology lesson. Trace the path through Phineas Gage's skull where a three foot seven inch tamping rod shot under the cheek behind the left eye and out, taking his frontal lobe with it. Yet he lived. Life is stubborn. Shatter a mind and the fragments rename themselves Vicky or Peggy Ann. Find a doll to clutch. The narcoleptic dachshund tries to waddle the long haul to his food bowl. Though his body is beached by waves of sleep, he wakes hopeful every time, famished. Meet the hypothalamus. Hungry, horny, happy. What drives us is the constellation of nuclei. What drives us is the size of an almond. The psych teacher herds us into the boys' bathroom, where each student is told to grab a urinal handle. Pull, she commands. Water rushes, 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 roar. Splash guards, crest, everyone, it's beautiful. And before the toilets are ready, she commands, pull again. No draw. We yank and yank, helpless, as she explains the refractory period of orgasm. <laughs> We're good students. We ace the test. It'll be years before we lay a hand to someone's skin without feeling cold, sticky steel. Years to learn that pleasure is a reflex neither pathetic nor finite. There were reports the rod whistled as it flew. A scientist modeled the trajectory and swore Phineas's mouth had been opened, that the open mouth had saved him. He met the first doctor and said, here's business enough for you. Phrenologists would say his organ of veneration had been destroyed, that his brain had no loyalty or adoration left. But we have seen the photographs his neatly slicked hair, and his buttoned vest. For the rest of his life, Phineas carried that iron. So just in case the one-two punch of uh, Metro cars mounting each other and sweaty teenagers with their hands on toilet handles doesn't, give you, uh, doesn't convince you that I have a totally normalized view of romance in the modern world, um, I'm just going to read a couple of snippets from a sequence that kind of, uh, I won't say dominates the book, but provides a half of the book without which the book wouldn't be what it is. Um, it's called The Traveler's Vade Mecum Sequence, and it was written in response to a solicitation from an editor for an anthology that we recently found out will be out next year from Redhead Press. So what I love is um, these poems that are in this book are actually in dialogue from a whole other collection that'll be out uh, in the future. And I've heard of individual poets, I think Frank Bidart, uh, Molly Peacock, who've actually seeded these poems into their own collections. Um, in 1853, A.C. Baldwin published a compendium of phrases, and they could be referenced by number, a, co a code for conversation over long distances, by telegraph, by letter, anywhere where discretion was valued, and the less characters you had to expend, the better. He called this the traveler's vade mecum, or instantaneous letter writer by mail or telegraph for the convenience of persons traveling on business or for pleasure and for others, whereby a vast amount of time, labor, and trouble is saved. <laughs> Line 
7,671 of a traveler's vade mecum. It is no secret here. Dirt, wrote a British anthropologist, is matter out of place. Drop a grape from bowl to table, and we call it dirty. Drop a grape to the floor, and it is trash. Bowl, table. These are ordering agents, ways to tell the functional from fallen. Skin, tendon, these are ordering agents. You want to kiss my mouth, but not the teeth inside my mouth. You want to hold my hand, but not the blood within that hand. There is a truth in you, but it won't be a dirty truth until it tumbles into the air between us. In this city, there is always a long walk home in 7 a.m. light, high heels stabbing the subway grates. A walk home, past gutters littered with the non secateur of chicken bones, wings that once held a dream of flight. And one of the pleasures of the sequence uh, was in part returning to the colloquialisms in the language of the time. Again, the book was, came out in 1853. So you encounter a word like flower, um, and you realize, okay, flower is being discussed as a commodity, uh, as a physical substance, as a food. Um, and when you're given a line like line 4,234 of a traveler's body mecum, flower is firm, uh, your mind turns not only to stocks, but to hardtack. Baking two parts flour to one part water could stop a bullet. So good soldiers carried their hard tack over their hearts. Break it down with a rifle butt, flood it, fry it in pig fat to make hellfire stew, gnaw it raw, and praise the juice. Does wheat prepare for this as it grows, seeking the light in a half-thawed field? Do stocks know? Their strength is merely in their number. What is ground down we name flour in promise that it will be made useful. Otherwise, it's just dust. Sheet iron crackers, teeth dullers. Would you call it starving if a man dies with hard tack still tucked in his vest? Would you call it food if the bullet comes only at the moment he gives in? and swallows. Line 6,459, the country is quite mountainous. The goats of Kauai care little for our taxonomies. No one has told them they are not mountain goats. No one has shown them the logs of Captain Cook who seeded their ancestors with a casual hand. No one has spoken of how the villagers stabbed him face down in the surf before baking his skeleton free of flesh. The goats gram gamble and bray on the cliffs. They do not stop at the dirt. They chew to the root. We watch them from our little ship floating in a bigger blue thing they have no name for under the pull of our hot daily something. But these goats, they orbit nothing. They move no way but forward. And I think in that spirit, it's appropriate to end just with a short little poem. Um, if you read the book, you'll find out what poem I ended on. If you'll read the book, you'll find out what the title poem is. But this little guy, again, I'm so grateful for everyone we have um, in the room this evening. Uh, so grateful to Politics and Prose, which has given me a reading in support of all four of my books. That's amazing to have that relationship with the store. Um, my family. Uh, Kyle, who I actually drafted the first draft of his poem while listening to you during your tribute to Gwendolyn Brooks at the Library of Congress. Uh, but I hope it's a compliment rather than like, yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's doing this thing, but let me screw. <laughs> but I want to dedicate this poem to Champness, my husband. We just celebrated our one year anniversary. It's a little love poem. Yeah. <laughs> here's to one year, here's to making it through the first year, right? That's Ukulele. The vessel is simple, a rowboat, 
among yachts. No one hides a Tommy gun in its case. No blues man runs over his uke in a whiskey rage. The last of the Hawaiian queens translated the name gift that came here, while Portuguese historians translate jumping flea, the way a player's fingers pick and fly. If you have a cigar box, it'll do. If you have fishing line, it'll sing. If there is to be one instrument of love, not love vanished or imagined, but love, it's this one. Fit a melody in the crook of your arm and strum. Thank you. <laughs>